So we're joined here today by Dr. Divya Srikumaran, who is Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at Wilmer Eye Institute, Johns Hopkins, and also Chief of Wilmer's location at Odenton, Maryland. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Cheryl, for having me. We're so pleased to have you join us today. As you know, earlier we spoke with Dr. Tim McCall regarding yes. the recent study that appeared in the American Journal of Ophthalmology with regard to the growth of the physician assistant profession. We want to just kind of take a deeper dive and continue that discussion and talk more about the shift that we've seen in, from primary care into specialty care, specifically surgical subspecialty. Could you talk a little bit more about that, that shift that we're seeing? Yes, absolutely. So I think that in general, uh, PAs are being viewed as a much more valuable partner in providing healthcare. And I think at least as a res in residency training programs and at hospital systems, uh, as the 80 hour work week rule uh, came into play, residents could no longer work the long shifts and you know cover all of the needs of a hospital as they used to in the past and I think that has supported the growth of PAs working in hospital settings alongside residents and alongside um, fellows and other trainees in our own program but that's how we started with this process our residency program previously had eight residents and we had gradually reduced it because we had ended affiliations with some community partners mm -hmm. and we went down to five residents and so when I was serving as residency program director we needed to find out how to cover all of the hours of call for the hospital and the ED uh, and we explored options and we thought that we should you know follow a path that other surgical subspecialties orthopedics general surgery uh, ENT had followed in our hospital and so we decided to hire a PA and it was very successful in our program we you know we published our first paper actually just describing our experience in which the residents had more time to devote uh, to other surgical experiences or other clinic experiences that were more high yield for their level of education and what they needed to graduate. And uh, the PA actually shortened the wait time for patients. So patients that were being uh, seen in the ED and needed an ophthalmology consult or that had inpatient inpatients that needed ophthalmology consults, our response time for these patients dropped by about 28 minutes on average after hiring a PA. So it sort of shortened the waits for patients in the ED, which is a big problem nationally, and uh, it enhanced the experience for our residents. And so, you know, you can see how adding other professionals to your team can expand your capacity to provide more care, to improve the care, or, you know, at least, again, reducing wait times will at least improve patient satisfaction, I think. And so this is how we started the process. And then we decided to do this second survey looking at PAs nationally because I think PAs in other specialties are very well represented again within orthopedics within general surgery but ophthalmology it's still quite rare so back in 1990 they did a survey through the American Academy of Ophthalmology and at that time there were only 52 PAs practicing in ophthalmology and now nearly 30 years later we <laughs> 94. So we haven't really had the explosion of PAs in ophthalmology as there are in other subspecialties. Um, you know, there's over 140,000 PAs in the country right now, and less than 100 identify as ophthalmology PAs. Why, I mean, why do you suppose that there are these barriers, or why, why has why do the numbers not reflect as much in ophthalmology as other specialties? You know, that's a great question. And I think one of the reasons is that within PA schools, there is very little exposure to ophthalmology. So there is not a lot of lecture and curricular time devoted to ophthalmology. And part of that is because they're trained as generalists. So there's a lot to learn in two years of PA school. And so, you know, we find this even actually in medical schools where the time that's spent on ophthalmology is gradually becoming reduced as you have more and more to learn in other areas. So exposure for PAs is one, and then PAs then, if they haven't been exposed to it, they're unlikely to seek out opportunities or be interested in it. And on the flip side, I think ophthalmologists don't recognize that PAs could be a partner in providing care and expanding their own capabilities in providing care and be a part of the team. I think our natural tendency is to lean on optometrists as our care collaborators because they already learn uh, ophthalmic care and you know they've devoted their training to vision care over the last few years and so PAs aren't sort of it's people just don't think about it um, 
And I think, you know, this is where we have an opportunity if we could have more training programs for PAs uh, or expand rotation options for PAs that are in PA school to experience ophthalmology, then you'd have, again, a more skilled provider, who, you know, coming to your practice and two, you'd have more interest amongst PAs maybe in exploring ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what might be some steps that we could take to kind of unite <laughs> the two, you know, ophthalmologists to make them more aware and the same with PAs to help them make that transition into ophthalmology? Well, I think this is, you know, so writing about it is probably the first step is just mm -hmm. to help this awareness. And so that's, that's the first step we've taken. And then I think the next step is going to be to try to have either a group of, a working group of, uh, like a society, so to say. There is interest amongst the PAs in ophthalmology now in joining a society and so if there's a group of people who are really trying to expand awareness of the role that PAs can play in providing ophthalmic care, I think having increasing educational opportunities, so more conferences uh, that are targeted towards what PAs need to learn, having more training programs, again, working with PA schools to have rotations within ophthalmology and offering that as a first step so that PAs would be exposed. And again, if PA schools and ophthalmology departments, if, if there is a link uh, and sort of a connection, uh, I think that makes a big difference. I know that at University of Utah Moran Eye Institute, they do have a PA school. And one of my colleagues there, Jeff Petty, he, he's told me that they've had many PA students rotate through their department. And that's been very instrumental in identifying, you know, and, and sort of engaging more PAs. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting in ophthalmology long term. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, while, you know, PAs are involved with procedures and surgery, they largely do not perform independently. And when they do perform, what is their scope generally limited to? So with an ophthalmology, you know, for PAs in general, actually taking one step back, their scope is going to be limited in part based on regulations state by state, which can vary. And then in part based on the this the sort of the relationship with their collaborating physicians. So typically you're as a as an ophthalmologist, you would have some say over what you feel comfortable allowing a PA who's working with you to do. So in, in Kaiser, I know PAs are performing intravitreal injections. There have been some reports of of the fact that, that has you know worked safely and allowed a physician to expand the amount of care that they're providing to other patients since the PAs, you know, patients who are coming in for monthly or, you know, every eight week uh, injections, having some of that volume be of patient care being handled by a PA just allows, you know, a physician to, to take care of more patients overall. So I think that's something that's occurring there. In our own institution, we um, have hired our PAs primarily to support our residency program mission. Uh, and in order to work with the residents, uh, there, you know, the PAs are taking some of the call for the ED and sort of serving as the primary consultant and then calling the residents to be involved when there's cases that are surgical. So we're very upfront that the surgical experience and sort of the more complex cases, even medical complex cases, all of those, the residents are involved in so that they're still learning from that patient care. And, you know, at the same time, the PA is not being left alone on their own to manage really complex patients. They have this safety umbrella and the safety net of providers, not just residents, but faculty of all different specialties to back them up. And so it's a, it's a nice sort of collaborative working relationship, but we made it very clear that the surgical procedures would be performed by our trainees if and when it's appropriate. And so it's not that we don't trust our PAs to learn this. It's just that we've chosen not for that not to be part of their job. And and they knew that up front and they were okay with it. Whereas, you know, in some, some situations you might have PAs who are very keen on doing procedures. And in our surveys, some were uh, doing procedures. So, you know, with our survey, we didn't really ask the question of, do you want to do the procedures and you're not able to, or are you just not interested in them and mm -hmm. it, it's okay. Uh, you know, so I think there's, it, everyone has their own preferences as well. Sure. And as the respondents indicated, there were a number of skills that they, they thought would be helpful to help them ob obtain a more, you know, potential uh, ophthalmology postgraduate towards that goal, towards that training. How do we get to that point, to that end point? 
Of so yes, yeah, so the, the skills, well, you know, our question was, do you think a residency training program, because PAs do have residency training programs, uh, there's about 104, I believe, that were registered when we had done this study, and none of them are in ophthalmology. Many of the PA training programs are actually in either emergency medicine or some of the surgical subspecialties, like a surgery training program. And so for different training programs, they will have surgery and surgical assisting as a bigger part of their training program, because for for those specialties, you really need an assistant in the OR. In ophthalmology, I think that it's a little less common that we need an assistant in the OR for our cases, like for cataract surgery, I don't really need a PA to, or I don't even need a resident or anyone else to help me with the surgery. We're fairly independent. There's some surgeries like retinal surgery where it's helpful to have an assistant, but again, out in the real world, you don't need a lot of assistance to do ophthalmic surgery like you do, for example, in orthopedics or in other subspecialties. So for other subspecialties, it's much more relevant to have a PA who really knows what your procedures are, become facile and skilled and capable in helping you. Um, but our survey did show that PAs would be interested in learning um, how to assist. And so, you know, possibilities for a PA would be, you know, doing blocks, providing, uh, you know, closing the eye, perhaps, um, you know, maybe assisting with femtosecond cataract surgery, like sort of setting up the laser settings, et cetera. There, there are things that PAs could help with if a surgeon needed that type of assistance. So maybe case to case though. Mm -hmm. So how might the development of formal PA postgraduate training programs in ophthalmology help to expand the pool of PAs who are qualified to practice in ophthalmology? So I think the biggest problem that, you know, I, uh, and again, this is an assumption on my part, uh, we haven't formally surveyed practicing ophthalmologists, but in a few papers, like sort of white papers that were written up, that was the concern, the fact that they would have to train someone from scratch is a barrier for uh, an ophthalmologist to consider hiring a PA, right? So again, an optometrist already comes in with basic eye care training and having to take a PA and train them from scratch, it's a lot of work for the hiring physician. And so if you had a program in which PAs could develop a skill set, then when you hire them as a hire, you know, there, there might be a lower burden or lower barrier amongst ophthalmologists to consider hiring PAs. So I think that's the biggest thing is, is making PAs a more attractive partner uh, in providing that care. Mm -hmm. So what might an example look like of, of a, a quote unquote, you know, model of a postgraduate training program for PAs? Um, so, you know, for, I think we would have to model these after other subspecialties. So ENT, uh, orthopedics, general surgery, they tend to have year long uh, training programs that are, so the PA is like a PA resident. They start residency one year after completing uh, PA school. And in that, they're working closely like a resident, essentially. So much like our first year ophthalmology residents are learning ophthalmology, they're learning the basics of how to do an eye exam. They do this by actually seeing patients and doing rotations in various services, you know, retina, cornea, glaucoma. They're developing facility with the slit lamp as well as doing uh, dilated fundus examinations. And so that they're checking pressures, basically all the nuts and bolts of an eye exam. That's sort of what, what you would learn through all of these rotations as you're seeing patients. And then potentially uh, you would have some rotations where they're actually observing and assisting in surgery as well. So I do think that for our a PA training program could very well mirror what a first year ophthalmology residency training program looks like. Uh, and you know it, they could sort of be integrated into into that experience, any place that has an ophthalmology residency. Mm -hmm. All right. How might the integration of PAs help to accommodate workforce gaps, you know, whether predicted or unpredicted? <laughs> Absolutely. So this is where there's definitely a mismatch, I think, in low, you know, for ophthalmology care, there's certain areas that have a shortage of ophthalmologists. And the reality is, even if they aren't functioning out in the community uh, as primary ophthalmology providers, PAs see a lot of patients in urgent cares. They see a lot of patients in the ED. 
And we know that a lot of ophthalmology patients present after hours to urgent cares and EDs for eye care. There's a lot of non-urgent ophthalmic complaints that end up in these facilities after hours because ophthalmology offices are closed. And so if we could expand the, the pool of uh, PAs that are trained in ophthalmology, I think they would be more comfortable triaging and managing a lot of patients that present again to urgent cares and EDs after hours and that's something that it, on some level they're already doing right so we, we haven't published this data but in our survey that we had performed we examined and asked questions about how much eye care other PAs who don't identify as ophthalmologists how much care they're providing in ophthalmology and a fair number are providing eye care on a weekly basis you know multiple times a week because in primary care and urgent care they're seeing these patients and so I think again if, even if you had a PA training program in ophthalmology where they got some experience they don't have to function as primary PAs in ophthalmology in offices there is needs in other situations. So even in places like New York City or Baltimore or you know, in cities where there's plenty of ophthalmologists, there's roles that I think are, are there for them. And we, we have an opportunity to sort of improve the care perhaps and comfort level of some providers who are still gonna bridge multiple specialties. Lots of PAs don't work in just one specialty. So they might be providing some care you know, in, in multiple areas. And so if you imagine a PA who's trained in ophthalmology working in an urgent care, they would have a lot of skills to, you know, to add to the care that they're uh, providing, not just for, you know, the musculoskeletal complaints or, you know, upper respiratory complaints, et cetera. A lot of the general common complaints that come in, I guess, uh, to an urgent care, but they would have a special expertise in being able to appropriately triage ophthalmology patients. Mm -hmm. And what might be the next step? You know, obviously there's not many in-person meetings right now, but in terms of yes. conferences or organizations, things like that? What, what's, what might be the next step? Yes, yeah, so I think that this is where um, the next step is going to be to raise awareness amongst the AAPA. So, you know, again, we ex surveyed not just PAs in ophthalmology, but their overall membership, and there was a lot of interest in ophthalmology knowledge and experience and training opportunities. And so as the AAPA and other PA conference organizers think through this, I think shedding light on the need and interest in ophthalmology is important so that we can try to partner, you know, ophthalmologists and PAs can try to partner to help fill the gaps in, in knowledge and, and create programming around this and, you know, in a socially distancing <laughs> and, and of course, you know, uh, in-person meetings, you know, making it part of their AAPA conference annually, for example, or locally. Lots of institutions hold uh, conferences, but I don't, I, I will admit, I don't think we target PAs as an audience for any of our CME meetings because it just doesn't occur to us. 